Hello. Oh my gosh. Welcome to Manufacturing E-Commerce Success. I am Damon Pistolka and I got to tell you, it's Halloween. So I decided I was going to dress up as my favorite manufacturing e-commerce champion, Nicole Donnelly. So welcome to the show today. Man, <laughs> Damon, dude, that is like such an outfit. You look exactly like Nicole Donnelly. It's like you've got the glasses, the, the like, man, you really went all out for that outfit, Damon. Oh, that thank is you. Cool. Yeah. yeah. You did it's a good a job looking work. like me. Man, is that oppressive. So, hey, we have an amazing, incredible guest here today. So, uh, mm -hmm. man, I am just so fired up to dig into this topic. What a great. So, okay, we'll, we'll, Nicole, thank you for joining us today. So, my name is Kurt Anderson. What an absolute honor. What a privilege to be here. Happy Friday, last Friday of October, last Friday wow. of uh, celebrating Manufacturing Month. And it's just been an absolute wonderful, incredible month celebrating manufacturing. And so we thought we'd bring on an esteemed, just wonderful colleague, just a great guest. And I know we changed seats around because usually he's sitting over there <laughs> and now he's down there. So Damon, Luca, Damon, happy Friday. How are you, dude? I'm doing great, Kurt. Doing great. It's kind of nice. I can run the comments here and put people up on the screen. So. Hey, and we just, we were just with Whitney about an hour ago, Nicole and I did a little, we did our jam session today at MNI University, go to nice. MNI University, I believe it's .com, and uh, check it out, they have all sorts of wonderful webinars, programs, Damon, you did one, and just yep. all sorts of great information for manufacturers, yep. so, all right, Nicole, what, what topic, when we have Damon, the Damon Pasoka in the hot seat, what topic should we be covering today, what would be a good juicy subject to dig into oh damon i don't know baseball well <laughs> yeah, we absolutely dig into baseball so you know what let's go let's go you know what i don't I, like there it is right there university all right whitney, thank and I dot not, whitney thank you so much guys so check that out there's all sorts of amazing people so Alan. yeah damon the world series is starting you know i don't know texas arizona that's uh, you know kind of like all right, let's go here. Damon. Damon, as a little boy growing up, <laughs> who was your hero? Who was your I can't hero? believe you haven't asked him this question yet. I think Thank I you. have, but we're going to go there today just for our esteemed, wonderful audience. So Damon Pastoka, our guest on this wonderful program, who was your hero as a little guy growing up? You know, I didn't, I didn't think about it until later, but it was my father. And mm -hmm. I really didn't I, and until later in life and just his persistence and and his tenacity, tenacity and and just not letting stuff stop him. Yeah. So let's. Yeah. Uh, hey, can we dig into that for a minute? Because I, I've, I've not had the honor or privilege of meeting your father. And if you don't mind me saying so, we uh, we lost dad during covid. I know sure. I, was, I was with you. The, the uh, yeah, we were online the week that that happened. And so that was during covid. So relatively recent. Share a little bit. Your dad is an incredibly inspiring story. Just share a little bit about your father. Well, my father, growing up in South Dakota, my father grew up on a farm. And at 16 years old, he got into a, uh, an accident and lost, you know, every bit of about six inches of his left leg. Mm. So he, from 16 years on, years old on, he had uh, a prosthetic uh, and he Went to college for a while and decided, nah, I want to be, I want to go back and farm. Mm -hmm. So the first, first thing was right there is, you know, someone that farming is not a, a, a spectator sport, right? It's, you got to be in it. And uh, watching him do that as I grew up all the way through it, we never even knew he was handicapped. My dad never mm -hmm. talked about it, never had a handicap sticker until he was well in his sixties and couldn't really use a prosthetic anymore. And, you know, on that kind of determination, we just didn't know it. It, it was just, it was, you know, you just learn about life and it just, the things happen and you go on. And he taught us that with the kind of things that happened on the farm, the kind of things that happened in life. And I didn't really appreciate that until later in life. Mm. Gosh, what an inspiration. And so, you know, married, married a sweetheart and how, yep. many, and how many siblings was there? Five of you? Yeah, there's five of us all. So I'm the oldest of three boys or four boys. Yeah, my sister's the youngest. 
Yeah. Awesome. And what and share with everybody dad's name, please. Dwayne. 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 And so, and guess what? What a qu- another common factor for you and I, Damon. Guess what my dad's name is? <laughs> no <Dwayne>. kidding. <laughs> you guys know what? My dad's name isn't Dwayne, but his brother was Dwayne. So there you go. Popular, yeah. popular name. So hey guys, hey, we've got we've got Alan here coming yep. in from London. London. Oh, happy Friday to you, my friend. We've got man, I love I love Lizbita, if I'm going to say that correctly, we've got Brian in the house. So, so guys, he join us, uh, drop a note in the chat box. Let us know that you're out there. We'd love to hear from you. And we've got Damon, the our co-host, on the hot seat today. And so this is such an honor, such a privilege, kind of like Halloween-ish weekend as we're coming into things. And we wanted to dig in to have Damon. Damon is an expert on helping folks grow their businesses, but the next step is to sell that business. So Damon, name of your company is Exit Your Way. And could you please share with the folks who and what is Exit Your Way? How do you make the world a better place? Well, we we help business owners combat a problem that they may not even know they have until it's too late. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's really the fact that selling a business is incredibly hard or succeeding a business is incredibly hard as you and you really don't hear about it. You don't, the business owners, founders aren't really educated on this until they try to sell their business or they try to succeed their business and they go, wow, this just isn't working. And at that point, they're, you know, they might be out of gas. They might be too far along. It really doesn't work. And, and it, it leads to a lot of disappointment. So what we do is we try to educate and help people understand what they're up against give them the tools to be able to do what they need to do. And if they need to help, need help, we'll help them get their businesses ready to facilitate their exit and help them exit their business. Go ahead. I have a question about that. How far in advance do you recommend business owners start having these conversations? Like what, what time frame should they be planning to start that process? Well, people, you know, you listen to some people that are theorists, right? They'll say, when you start your business, you should know how you're going to get out. That doesn't work that way in real life, right? (laughs) You know, we all get thrust into entrepreneurship and we have to do it. Uh, We have to do it. We're doing it for whatever reason at that point. You're trying to, and it's different. But really, from a financial planning, you know, business planning perspective, it really depends on the size of the business, because if you have a business that say the the value of that business is in excess of $10 million or something like that, you can literally save hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes if you start planning six, seven years ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's some there's some time frames and some things and you have to find the right lawyers to do it. But there's there there. So in that business, you might be seven to 10 years. You should really look at it and start thinking about it. And that's why you know, the exit your way process, we really start with our clients figuring out what does your what does your exit look like? Are you succeeding? Are you selling? And when? Because we we need to understand that early enough, depending on and that early enough depends on the size of the business to really maximize their the results of their efforts. Man. All right. Tons of pack right there. Damon, I would love for you to share a number. So for our friends, our entrepreneurs out there, again, thank you for joining us. Happy Friday to you. We've got Damon Pasuk on the hot seat today. Damon, how many businesses, is there a percentage of businesses that actually successfully sell compared to that just kind of vanish in the wind? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, in fact, I was putting this together for another presentation in a couple of weeks and it's 70% of businesses don't get sold by vet, wow. Investopedia. Investopedia says that 70% don't get sold. Right. Um, now, is that, is that like they're intentionally trying to sell it and they don't sell it or just? A, yeah. Just intentionally market? trying to sell it and don't sell it. And if you talk to That's Mike awesome. Finger, Mike Finger is another person. I, I quote him a lot. He's on LinkedIn. He, I believe he lives in Wisconsin. He talks about this a lot, does a lot more. Exit Oasis is his company, does a lot more research on this. And he will he actually goes through what you're talking about, Nicole, of all businesses. And when you look at of all mm-hmm. businesses, it's pitiful. It's like 0.01 or Jeez. 1% actually. It's really ugly. It's really ugly because a lot of people don't even try to sell, right? And yeah. 
that's in the the heck of it is is this 70 percent that decide they want to do something and and get to that point and then try to do it mm-hmm. they're going to spend a year trying to sell that business right and it's a waste of time if you're not ready so what are the main reasons why the 70 percent fail mm-hmm. great question <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's loaded <laughs> do we, no, do no, we have- it- do we have time? <laughs> you, can research, you can research. Do you research it? I mean, because people can listen to this today and then go back to Google and look at it, you know, because there's been tons of articles written about it. But the primary reason why a business will not sell is buyers and sellers can't come to, ter- to terms with price mm-hmm. or terms of the sale. Uh, because, you know, it's it's no and it's no matter if it's a very valuable business or, or a, a, a bakery business on the corner that I'm running. Right. That that so I can have a fifty million dollar revenue business a year. I can make ten million dollars a year, and if my business isn't set up right, and the and the equity groups, because you get into a certain size, and you're going to have to have investment buyers or a strategic buyer comes in, whatever it is, another one in your industry is going to buy you, and you're not set up right. That business, say they're mil- making the fifty million dollar revenues, making ten million in profit, that should be just guessing. 50 to $80 million should be the value of that business. Well, what will happen if it's not set up right is if you get an offer, it's going to be 40 million. It's going to be 50 million. And you know, it's worth 70 or 80 million. And you're going to look at it as the owner and go, that's not nearly enough. Why would I ever sell it for that much? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about price, price and terms, it's not just that, I've got unrealistic value expectations. It's just that the market doesn't want to pay me what I want for it. What seems reasonable to me. And that's why this whole journey about learning valuation and really understanding what drives your business value and what your business really is. The value is, is so critical because when you read the things on the papers about, uh, uh, yeah, wow, God, how old does that make me sound? Nobody reads it out of a paper. I haven't read, I haven't picked up a paper in 10 years, probably. Right, right. Yeah, but but you read in an article that says, listen, this company sold for X amount of money. There's so much behind that, mm-hmm. right? Because if if a public company buys it, a public company can pay much more than a private company because they're valued way higher than a, than a private company. Just based their public and your private. Mm-hmm. Could be the same size. The other thing is, too, is you don't know the terms behind that sale. And this happens a lot in SaaS companies. I love it because SaaS companies will say, well, I get 10x my revenue for for the profit, you know, for the sale of my company. Okay, so you got $3 million in revenue. You're going to get paid 30. Well, the terms are so critical because they'll get they'll say, yeah, we're going to pay you $30 million. We're going to pay you $3 million down. And if all these projections that you said you're going to hit come to fruition over the next five years, we'll pay you the, the 30 million, but you got to hit all these milestones to get there. So the biggest reason why businesses don't sell is that right there, that whole price and terms and what I'm getting offered and what I'm at. And that's, that's why where we really start with when we work with clients is to, first of all, understand as a, as a business owner, understand what am I trying to do? Like anything with anyone, it's like, go out and figure out where I've got to go, go to your financial planner and, and talk to your family, whatever you got to do and say, listen, if I sell my business, how much money do I really need to do whatever I do next? Well, what I want to do next, what my lifestyle, if I want to start another business, if I want to go off and go on a beach, just figure out that number, what I need from the business. Then I've got a reference point because a lot of times business owners, their reference point will change or it'll be ambiguous before you start the process. And you really can't be that way because you need to know what your what your bottom line is. Right. I'm going to and you got to put that line in the sand and say, hey, if I don't get three million dollars, that's not going to be enough for me to do what I want. I'm just going to have to stay in the business. I'm going to do this. But if I do, I'm ready to go. Right. Get that perspective. So first of all, understand where you're going and what you need from that business, because yeah. that's, that's critical. Um, and then that's where it comes back again to that big piece in value we talked about. Let's get comfortable with that realistic value of our business today. OK, 
because that realistic value of your business today is not a secret. Your buyers know what it is. The market knows what it is. Your financials will tell you what the value is. And then risk factors will adjust that value up and down. But you got to get comfortable with where that is with your risk factors so that you can then begin to go, I need $3 million, I'm worth two or I'm worth four, but I've got to adjust my risk factors to make it more attractive and get it in. So it's a sellable business or my successors will want it. And it's, it's, it's a complex thing. It seems simple, but it's complex when you start to mix in the, the risk factors and the unique factors in every business that make it either, either better or worse for the prospective uh, buyer or successor. So I talked well, an awful lot there. Sorry. Well, oh my <laughs> Damon, dude, that might, man, that was a drop the mic right there. Nicole, that was, and that's, how about, you know what? I'm even giving you a round of applause right there for that one. That was so good. That was phenomenal. So much to unpack right there, man. I have like, a, I absolutely have like a dozen questions under that. One thing, a comment I'd like to share. So let's, let's think about like some of the smaller entrepreneurs that might be out yep. there, small manufacturer, maybe mid-sized manufacturer. And what I love to say is like, you know, when you're thinking about selling your business, you know, it's like selling your home. You know, like if you always treated your house you know, if you put your house up for sale, boy, everything's going to be immaculate, right? You're yep. staging your house. <laughs> boy, if if I always tell my wife, I'm like, man, wouldn't it be great if we, like, we could make our house like look that pristine? Like, let's keep it clean. Let's keep it tidy. So if you kind of just have that mindset, you're not really working hard and it's not a dramatic thing like the stage or show my house. Probably not realistic, right? Or like when yeah. company comes over, that type of thing. But my point is, let's talk about it from a business standpoint. If I have a nice, you know, I'm trying to build a brand. I have a nice company. My, my financials are pristine. Like if somebody wants my, like Damon, I can't tell you, like I, you know, my story, I was looking for a business for years and like, Hey, can I see your financials? Well, I need to, I'm like, when, you know, when I ran my business, I did a lot of things really dumb, really, really dumb. One thing that I've learned a long time ago, I just need to hit a button. I could have my financials within seconds. And that really helped escalate to sell my business. So. I'm going to stop on that. Here's where I want to go. When you're talking to that entrepreneur, I, I like I had a tagline, you know what your business is worth? I've, and I've worked with dozens of entrepreneurs that want to sell their business. I'm like, you know what your business is worth? Not a single penny more than the person across the table from you that has what that check is that they're willing to cut. So I love what you're saying. Like if you need, I need $3 million. Well, I need to find somebody that thinks that this business is worth $3 million. Can you talk a little bit about like how, you know, like, can you have that mental attitude of like, of the next person coming into this? That's yeah. the success, not just what you need, what that next person needs to be successful. Yeah. And that's what we talk about. It's a great point, Kurt, because when we talk about selling businesses, we talk about it like selling a product, right? Only the difference is your product is a business, mm -hmm. the business you're selling. I agree. And this is, this is like... One of the things that I love when when our clients get this right, how much time do you spend worrying about your products and services and how you how you communicate about that with your customers? Mm -hmm. OK, now, how much does a customer spend with you compared to how much is your business worth? You know, it's like this and your business is worth this much. Mm -hmm. Don't you think you should be thinking about that? The next person who's going to be buying your business or successor to make sure that you're communicating and giving them something that they really want. Mm -hmm. It's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. That buyer's perspective or the successor's perspective is huge. And, and their, theirs are really different than you as the person in the business today. You've had maybe a decade or more to get comfortable with how that business runs. You started out years ago and you have one really good customer they might be 70, 80% of your business and you've known them for 20 years. They're not going anywhere. This is great. Well, if I've got my business and Nicole comes into my business, she doesn't know that person, that company, that relationship for 20 years. That's a huge risk. If that goes away, that much of my revenue just dropped out. Mm -hmm. You know, and so and the other thing that, that there's that that customer concentration is a huge thing. That's why buyers bring it up all the time is that those relationships to them are not forged over years. They have um, 
we'll talk about this. I won't go there right now, but that, that whole buyer's perspective, then they're looking at that, all those relationships with suppliers and customers and going, listen, they have to be good business relationship. They have to be sound business relationships. But if I'm hold held hostage to a supplier or a customer with more than, you know, 20, 25% of my revenue, um, it's, it's going to make it more challenging for us to, to buy that business because of the risk. Then, <laughs> so those, ben those relationships like that are, are good to have, mm -hmm. but they really, if you're the founder of the business, the more you can transition those relationships to under others in your business. So they're maintaining them. Employees are maintaining them or the, the business itself really is, is they're doing business to business more than person to person in some of those. And that's not a good way to say it, but yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? We're trying to get that, get that and have duplicate resources when you can. That's a big deal. Cause that the risk profile is so much different. The other thing that you and I, anyone that's been in the business a while had in their own business, isn't going to have to deal with that. The person coming in is, is if say they come in and they have to pay me a million dollars for my business, they're probably going to get a loan of some sort to pay for that. Right. So they have cash that they got to take out every single month and pay for that loan. You as the owner now probably don't. You may not. Yeah. You may have a line of credit, which is normal, and that works in and out naturally. But that loan that they have to carry increases their their risk. It, and it reduces the cash flow they have available to go through things. So it amplifies this, this customer concentration or supplier problem or market problem they could see that you don't have today. You just don't yeah. have that. And, you know, these payments that these people are coming, it's not like a few thousand. This is like 50, <laughs> 500, you know, it can be three, 50 to $75,000 a month sometimes that they're right. paying for these things just because this is over 10 years, if it's an SBA kind of thing or whatever. So, and, and that's, that's a huge thing because these people coming in buying your business are probably putting a lot on the line. You know, especially if it's a private individual buying the business, you know, you look at something sub six, seven million dollars where the FBA can still do it with an individual or a small business buying another business. It's they're putting a lot on the line. They're personally guaranteeing this loan. And that's where those kind of risk factors run in, run in. Uh, they they'll stop buyers. They'll just stop buyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Nicole, as a fourth generation entrepreneur, you know, in all different different industries, different walks of life that you've seen in your family and yourself as an entrepreneur and, you know, you're building a business. What, what are your takeaways, thoughts right here as I go through, as you're listening to Damon? Well, I will say like, yeah, I've had my father owned a successful manufacturing company. My great grandfather owned a motel or excuse me, my grandfather, I can't keep track. There's too many businesses. My grandfather owned a hotel and my great grandfather owned an owned an oil company. And so I have direct experience kind of seeing like the repercussions of what kind of went wrong and what <laughs> went right because of how those uh, decisions were handled. Um, you know, so it's a huge thing and it can impact like a lot of businesses are family owned and it, it that adds a whole nother element to this um, process that can be pretty. Oh, yeah difficult to untangle and deal with. And I, I can, I can say from experience from every single person in my family who, you know, had a business, uh, they all tried to actually, no, my father never tried to sell his business, but my grandfather sold his business or it basically he didn't sell it. He gave it to his children when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And then my great grandfather ended up selling it to his children or they bought themselves out. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing, but it's complicated. It's hugely, hugely complicated. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, I think this is great what you're doing because I know for my father, for example, he never thought about planning for his exit. He never talked about that. He never planned for it, really. It, it was never a thought or a consideration. And, you know, you just never know. Life is fragile. You don't know what's going to happen and, you know, how long you're going to be here. And, so I think as a business owner, you do, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you got to think about these things. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. And it does. I mean, it does. 
if you're looking at it at, at a retirement kind of thing or, or something, it kind of stinks, really. Let's be honest. We, you know, a lot of us love our careers, what we want to do. And thinking about the end, it kind of sucks. But, you know, we, it does. It does. And I, 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 mean, I empathize with them, right? Right. You know, it does. But you, you make a great point, Nicole. And it's one of the first things we talk about with clients, too, is like, hey, what kind of what's the, the, the plan Z, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. if you if you end up on a hospital bed or get hit by a bus what are we doing right because yes. i don't want to come in here and not know that right because i want to make sure that this carries on to whatever you want right. and and back to your family thing that's where the first step in this is not simply going to a financial planner and figuring that out for yourself it's figuring it out for everybody that's involved and going listen okay because <laughs> as as you get into these businesses some of these have far-reaching effects right you can you can have six family members working in there and all yep. of them have different ideas about hey I get the business or we just, or, or, and, you know, and the owner, the founder might think, no, oh, I'm getting out, I'm getting paid, you know, or whatever. It, it's that, that whole thing is horrible if you don't oh. talk it through. Right. And it, it can have a huge negative impact on family relationships. Oh, huge. Yeah. If you're right. not very thoughtful about it, I've seen yeah. that first command. So right. it is really very critical and important um, because that you have those conversations with your family members as uncomfortable yeah. as it is, you know, they need to understand so that if there is a situation where someone dies unexpectedly or whatever, everyone kind of knows, well, this is the plan. This is, this right. is the success and plans is what dad or mom wanted to do with the business. Yeah. So, Damon, let's, un let's unpack this. Uh, I, you had a great point. You mentioned like SBA. So like, you know, most companies, what 75% of all companies in the country are 20 employees or, and less. Yep. Right. So odds are somebody listening, you know, you know, if we're talking like, Hey, 56, you know, 50, 60 million, those are more the exceptions. Yep. You know, most businesses are in the hundreds of thousands, you know, millions, low millions. So let's go here. I jokingly kind of said, you know what your business is worth, you know, not a penny more of what somebody's willing to pay for it. So like if they're willing to overpay you, God bless them somewhere. They had the financial resource, but if they have to pay that back, you know, your legacy might not continue on. Let's go here. I sometimes share it like, Hey, you want to know what the value of your business is? Go to a bank and ask them like, what is the largest, greatest loan that that bank is willing to give you? That's another good way to get a valuation. So let's talk about like financing options or like what you see for small businesses, like making that transition, making that sale. Talk about like, what are some of the options there for financing? Well, you know, the SBA does a great as a great loan program for buying businesses. I th I forget what it is, 7A loan program or something like that. You know, a 10 10 percent down, 10 to 20 percent down, you can buy a, buy a business. And it's it's something that I think that, you know, you really should be looking at if if you need funding for buying a small business. Uh, like I said, lo loan up to $5 million that way. And, and we see a lot of people leverage that to, to buy businesses in the seven, eight, nine million million, $9 million range, even because they can do seller financing and other things or inject equity ahead of it to do that. Um, and that's really good. And you're right. The, the SBA, talking to an SBA banker is a great way to get your valuation. We use it as part of what we do looking at go to market pricing, right? Because the SBA is going to, tell you how much they'll loan on your business based on the cash flow, the industry, all this kind of stuff. Right. And, um, you know, you can do it easily enough if you just said, listen, how, what's, what's it cost for a million dollars over 10 years at the current interest rates, and then multiply that annual cost by like 1.4. And if your business makes that much cash every year, that'll support about a million dollars in price. So the last time I figured it out, the interest rates have gone up a little bit since, but it took, takes about $220,000, $225,000 in cash flow, free cash flow to support $1 million in business value. So mm -hmm. it's a $5 million business. You should have a million one-ish kind of thing cash flow to be able to support a $5 million price. Right. So let's... Let's dig into that. Where if we're there, if this is a good transition, not transition, but good segue, talk about evaluation. So, you know, let's, I know like you help, uh, you assist, you have a great process program that you uh, do evaluations for companies. Talk about like, so for that entrepreneur out there, they're like, you know what? I hadn't really thought about this. Nicole's got me thinking about it. Damon's got me thinking about it. Maybe I should go this route. 
what are some steps for to help evaluate your business on top of like SBA or going to your local bank? What are some other things that they should be considering? Yeah, there. I mean, there's if you if you want, you can go out and get you know a free valuation. They're online; you can find them. Mm-hmm. They're worth about what you get, right? They're going to use a the overall <laughs> average of it's two point five percent times the seller's discretionary earnings is the average mm-hmm. under three million dollars. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. Right. You can go all the way up into it can cost you ten thousand dollars or more to get a certified valuation you can use for IRS purposes. But the most common thing that we see and that you get with a, a reasonable entry kind of valuation is market pricing. Right. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of databases out there that that show what people are currently paying for businesses like yours. Mm-hmm. and what they've been paying. And that's really those comparables and comparing your business to that is is where the valuation really is a useful tool for you. Because you can look at them and we understand from those kind of comparables, we go, okay, what was the top line revenue? What was the gross, gross profit? What was the net profit? Mm-hmm. What's the industry doing? And you can really compare your business against that, especially when you look at, okay, now, if I'm looking at a $3 million or a million dollar revenue business, how much gross profit does it average of all these sold? And what are the ones that were just like mine? And what was the average of that? You start to com- you really get some more detailed information from a valuation that's going to dig into that level of detail. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that helps you a ton then looking forward, because now I not only know where the rest of them are, I know where I am in comparison to everyone else. Am I good? Am I bad? If I'm good, I should be able to get a little bit of premium. If I'm bad, I can work on it and get my value up. And Mm -hmm. I should realize that value that I'm getting is going to be harder to get if I'm not above average or at least at average. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of detail you can get from a, from a paid valuation that, that will allow you to really utilize that going forward. Mm -hmm. That's cool. All right. So let's go here now. You've got, as far as evaluation goes, before uh, earlier, you mentioned like, you you know, what's your number, especially for the retirement situation? Yeah. You have a lot of clients that you mentioned, you know, 40s, 50s. They're not at yeah. traditional, say, retirement age. We're like, you know, I've been doing this for 30 or 40 years. I'm going to, you know, sell this for X. And that's my, re- you know, as entrepreneurs, we don't have the luxury of that, the pension or, you know, like a fixed benefit plan or what have you. So like there, you know, a lot of people, uh, husband and wives, teams, uh, solopreneurs have put in 30, 40 years into a business and they think it's worth X. And unfortunately it's not quite worth X. Like how, what are some steps that an entrepreneur can do to like help elevate their company? Maybe if like they do have that 60% of sales or with that one customer or some of the other things that might be bring that evaluation down. What are some steps that an entrepreneur can do to help elevate that that evaluation so they can get to that magic number that they're striving for? Yeah, you know, and it's it's not realistic for everyone to be able to get to that number with just the terminal value or the sale value of their business. That's the first place to start because mm-hmm. we've had clients in the past with uh, I remember a specific client was a small restoration company and and we talked with him about it and while he was able to grow his business, he almost doubled his business in the first year of working with him. We knew it was going to be three to five more years before he was able to actually generate enough cash from that because he increased over where it is his living needs were, right? So that increase went to investment so that over the course of five years, he got his total number together. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. at the end of the five years, he sold and completed the, the, uh, what he needed. And that was a retirement situation. Mm -hmm. And we have other clients, like you said, they're in their forties or fifties that are really looking at, okay, I'm in business now and I love it, but I don't love it enough to, to say that I want to be in this forever. What I want to do is I want to generate enough wealth. I can go do something else and not have to worry about, you know, running a business like I am today. Mm-hmm. And they put together their, their situation for that and what that looks like. Mm-hmm. And really what we're doing there then is going, okay, how are we reducing risk? Again, same kind of thing. Like you said, someone with one customer that makes up, that's a pretty simple one. Get a longer term contract with them if you can. Mm-hmm. 
Because if you can get a if you can get a two or three year contract with if you got a huge customer and you can get a, a multi year contract with them if they're like, hey, you know, you, you, you know, let's see what we can do and you do that, that's a huge thing. Yeah, yeah you can mm-hmm. do those things to do it. And uh, the other thing that we've seen too is 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 the buyer's perspective. They're looking for growth, right? Like I said, they've got to pay this debt down. They've got to do these other things and and flatline business to someone that's nearing retirement age is just fine, right? Don't have to put a lot in, get a lot of money out. It's like an annuity. Um, And that's not what buyers want. They want to see growth because they have to go beyond where you're at today to really make, make their money, right? They're, they're part of it. So one of the big things, and this is why people go, well, why are you always talking with marketing people and all that stuff? Well, growth is the biggest part of getting a business that people like. If you can turn your business, like if you can go from, two, five, 10% growth to 20, 30, 50% growth. You just, the buyer's risk profile, they just think this, the risk goes way down for a buyer because if that one customer leaves, I'm growing 30%. Mm -hmm. That customer's worth 15%, who cares? Yeah, it's going to sting a little bit, but it's not going to kill us. Those are the kind of things that you really can do is continue. So if you've got a customer that's that's a lot of your business, try to add more. Try to get a longer term contract with them. Mm-hmm. but it's, it's again it all comes back from that buyer's perspective understanding where they're coming from and what they really want right how yeah. let's let's go go ahead nicole do you have a question oh, no, 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 you can go ahead. Let's, let's go here what i find damon if and if you see this you know uh and nicole we were just talking about this this morning you know, like, like so many businesses manufacturers run it this is how we've done it not necessarily you know like the the stigma of like hey this is how we've always done it not to be yeah. there but just, you know, they've built this wonderful, you know, manufacturing. They turned it into a three, five, 10, $20 million company, you know, that they've, they've made it like they're in the, the higher echelon. Okay. I found a lot of entrepreneurs have a tough time putting themselves in the next buyer's shoes. They're just so locked and loaded on like what they did. Do you have any advice, whether it's psychological and like Nicole, you mentioned, it could, you know, whether it's family members, but even more so outsiders, you know, like, yeah. who, you know, who, and we could even scratch in that a little bit, Damon, like who are some usual suspects if you don't have the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter or a family member that's going to you know, want to take on the next, but we could talk a little bit about like, who are some of the usual suspects, but as an entrepreneur, how can you get that mindset to think about, can I put myself in the buyer's shoes and how can I make this attractive for them? Or how can I help them be successful to, for my own success? Yeah. Right? Your success is my success. That's I've thought about that a lot. And the first th- the first thing that comes to mind when I think about how as an owner I can make a buyer more comfortable is to think about your business like you are a buyer and then look at your information, look at what you've got to show somebody and go, okay, you've got 45 days to look at all this and then pay me how much money I want for this business. Right. Would you do it? Right. That's it. Cause I, I boiled this down a a few months ago. I was like, what is the hardest thing about selling a business? Mm -hmm. And it's the fact that a buyer only has this much time to pay this much money for something. Yeah. They got to make a decision. You know, we look at a house and, and it's real easy with a house, right? Cause I can go, there's a house right here. It's, looks like the one across the street look at the price you go that one bought for that that one's like that businesses aren't like that right yeah because they're all different cash flows different people are different there's so many other moving parts right and Mm -hmm. you really have to think about is my business attractive enough that i could sit down and look at look at this information that we've got and feel comfortable putting the money down that i need to put down that i'm asking somebody to right right Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. there's a lot more risk when you're bu- buy- buying a business and buying a house. The house is where you lay your head. A business has so much more risk involved. You just, yeah, so you can make, totally make sense. Mm-hmm. It could go away tomorrow. A business can go away yeah. tomorrow. Your house could burn down, but you got insurance. You know, yeah. you, your house could burn down. You still have the land under it. I mean, there's there's, there's so many, mm-hmm. but that 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 the biggest thing I think really is to, to be able to be comfortable enough with, with your business that if you walked into it tomorrow with blinders on and you would go, 
wow, this looks good. Mm -hmm. I would want to pay for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've probably done a lot. Right. So, so let's go there. Let's go into like the usual suspects, you know, first start friends, family, that type of thing and say, there's just not the, you know, uh, not the next generation or, or whatever. Who are some candidates that you advise for folks? Like, you know, where would we go to find a good quality buyer? That's you know, for, small, for smaller manufacturers, it's really the other people, you know, that have been competitors for years. Mm -hmm. Your best competitors are your first place that you want to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's 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 like this year we've actually this year, the buying and selling of businesses, selling business has been very hard this year because of the interest rate increases. Mm -hmm. But buying businesses have been very, very good for a lot of a lot of our clients. Right. And and I think about this in reverse. Right. So if I'm sitting here today and I want to get out of my business, I call Kurt. Kurt and I have been competitors. We know that, hey, we've been in business 20 years together or whatever. We both run a good business. Mm -hmm. Say, Kurt, I'm ready to get out. You know, has you got any interest? And oh, yeah, it's so much easier. Right. Kurt knows me. Right. Kurt knows my business. He may not be intimate with it. He may right. not know the uglies and the goods, but we just started off on a different plane. Exactly. Because if, if you and I are both manufacturing, whatever, 3D printed, such and such is, and, you know, we're kind of butting heads and like, that's tremendous value. I don't have a learning curve. I have a customer base. I can get your customer base. I can sell my widgets to, to your customer. So a lot of symmetry. I don't want to tip my toe. I guess maybe I am tip my toe into ethics. What about the competitor that like, Wait, dude, you're going to show me your financials. I can get underneath the hood. I can see anything and yeah. everything. I have no intention. How do you, how do you tip that? How do you, how do you navigate that? Damon? Yeah. You have to be careful about that. Right. And you have to understand, and, and it's got to be the things you, first of all, you want to make sure who you're dealing business you're doing business with is our ethical people, right? And it's good good people do business with good people. You know, you, you if you're reaching for a hail mary with somebody that's questionable, don't do it. It's yeah. just not worth it. You know, you can go to the outside world because we don't know who really at any given time is ready to buy a business. You know, and um, there's wonderful places like Biz Buy Sell and others where you list businesses for sale, and the open market can do it. But I want to tell you that that if you've got competitors that you respect. It is the best place to start. And even if it's you and I know each other, we still are going to have non-disclosure agreements. We're going to have non-solicitation agreements to make sure that if I'm sending you my information and all of a sudden you're calling my best customer, trying to tell them about we're selling and you take them over. Yeah. I got all kinds of legal recourse to do, to, to make sure that it's right. going to be a painful situation if you do. Right. Um, and you got to do that. You've got to protect yourself and, and you right. want to be protected as a person looking at the information. Right. And that's also why you want to, and this is something a lot of people I think miss do as well as you, you want to be fairly confidential about selling a business mm -hmm. until you get close to the end. Cause it, it scares employees, scares customers. Mm -hmm. And it, and it uh, honestly will scare everyone involved. Mm -hmm. And you got to be you got to be careful about how you're doing it. That's why a lot of people choose to use third parties to help them. Right. We can anonymize things. And right. So, yeah. So let's hit on that. So, you know, there. The, so the, to broaden that search a little bit bigger, you know, you could talk, you know, do you have key customers? Do you have key vendors? Do you have key suppliers? We just talked about competitors. If you're in a, an industry where like, you know, maybe there's not 10, 10 in your local community or, you know, whatever, but maybe uh, nationwide, if you belong to a trade association, well, maybe you're crushing it in, in whatever, Tennessee. Well, what about your, you know, uh, the person that's making the same thing or doing the same thing yep. as you in Utah or whatever. So, you know, trade associations, you know, find folks that are in your industry that speak your language because there's not the learning curve to. Yeah. Right. You know, equipment suppliers is another great place. Suppliers. Right. You know, if I'm a CNC place and I use a certain brand of CNC, your salesperson for that CNC company is probably traveling three states. Right. Right. It, it's really good for that. And right. you're great. The trade associations are wonderful places to look. And there are people that are that are in your industry that are actively buying companies as well. And you're going to look at other companies that are announcing acquisitions. Mm -hmm. and things like that, because those are good places to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, 
there are a lot of industries that are that are experiencing these roll ups. I personally really like it when you can have two, you know, in the same city or regional players, because I, I feel that creates a, a really a triple win. It creates a win for the for the seller because they can sell their business. I think it creates a win for the buyer because the buyer can, it, you know, they're probably a hometown person, a local person that's been in the community for a while and building in the community. And I think it really it, it creates a for the third part of that for the employees in the community because that that person there that that buys it down the street they're not they're not going to shut it down they're not going to run you know decide that they're going to offshore all that stuff they're going to keep it where they're at now and they're going to try to run it like they've been running theirs but just with a few more resources and do that i think that's to me that is the coolest thing when you see that happen because we took that that seventy percent number, and we just made one less going to the other side of that equation. When right. when we can make those good connections and those things can happen. Yeah, I love that. And and so the thing is, is like always having that mindset. You know, just as I said, you know, earlier, if you if you caught it, you know, like you know, treat, if you treated your home as if you're going to sell it, boy, you you're going to really enjoy how, you know how clean and, and organized your house is. Nicole, what comment do you have? Yeah, I was just curious from the buyer's side. Let's say. You know, let's say I'm someone, I've got some entrepreneurial spirit and I'm trying to decide, well, do I want to start a business from scratch or do I want to buy a business? You know, there's, there's several different power to, you know, do I want to be a fran? do you want to get a franchise, you know, for someone who's really entrepreneurial and wants to buy a business, what advice would you give to them in terms of how to determine whether they should, you know, just start from scratch versus trying to buy a business and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Awesome question. That is an awesome question. And we, with one of our clients, we're actually looking at both, right? Buying and starting different oh. locations. Um, it's interesting seeing the, seeing the dichotomy of those two. Um, you know, you're going to have to invest in your startup business, especially if you've got employees, right? If you've got to hire employees and you've got to rent, lease a space and you've got to do all that, you've got that, that time until you have revenue and you've invoiced revenue. And if you're a company that has terms with your customers until you get paid for that revenue before money starts coming in. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at setup cost, first of all, and this, you know, you can run in 40, $50,000 pretty easy with a small company setup, right? Then you go like, okay, now I got to start leasing. Say, say I'm going to take me a couple months of leasing and I got a couple months of employees. And so you're into this thing for a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars on a very small business before you know it. Mm -hmm. Well, when I look at what I can buy if I bought an existing business and I use something like the SBA, where I could take my hundred thousand dollars, I can put that 10% down on a million dollar business mm -hmm. that is generating a hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever it is. It's you know, or two hundred or whatever the right number right. is, but I'm generating cash. No, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that timing, that timing. And then, then when you talk about a franchise, now, if it's not a franchise, the, the, the key benefit in franchises is, is everything is set up. You know, you go to Subway, I don't have to worry about how to make a sandwich at Subway if I got a Subway <laughs> franchise, right? I know where I'm right. getting my meat and cheese. I know where the soda comes from. All that stuff is set up. That is the nice thing about a franchise. Franchises, though, the, the, the challenge with those are is it you're buying a job usually. Yeah. Until you're, you buying get, a job. you're buying a job. And that's one of the things that you get with a franchise. So you really want to be able to go, if I don't want it just to be a job, I'm going to have to put in the time in the first one and buy more and put mm -hmm. more together to really make something that's going to get, create wealth. Mm -hmm. But the, the startup to buying is is a number is something people should look at because starting yeah. up costs a lot more money than you realize. Yeah. And and a lot more risky in a lot of ways. Cause you yep. just, you know, I mean, what is it? 90% of all startups fail. That's mm -hmm. sad to say, but like, you know, a true startup in the sense of right. Yeah. Four out of five in the first five years fail. And so yeah. and Damon, uh, I know we could start, man, I could talk to you. I just geek out in this conversation. So, Hey, and a couple, we've got a couple of highs yeah. here. So, Hey, happy Friday to you guys here. We've got Alexander's dropping a note and he says, uh, Hey, maybe it's better to prepare the audience and show them the next owner. And we've got another hello here. So guys, happy Friday. We're going to start winding down.
Damon, you love to preach and share. Uh, Nicole, gosh, you just teed that question up just so perfectly. You love uh, the growth by acquisition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly, and, and that's a great point. I'm going to take $100,000. I'm going to put it down on a brand new startup. I have zero sales or revenue and, and cross, fingers are crossed. I could take that $100,000, tie it in with an SBA loan. I now just bought myself a million or a multi-million dollar business. And so now let's say I'm an existing business. And man, I've got energy. I've got moxie. And I have no intention of exiting right now. I want growth because I am thinking long term. I do want to exit five, six years from now. And boy, I could add a new line and invest that hundred thousand dollars, or I can go buy a company and bring their sales in. Talk a little bit. We'll start winding down, but just share your growth by acquisition strategy. I think that small business owners should always be looking for growth by acquisition. I mean, oh. even if I'm a say I'm a single person garage door company, right? And I've, I've looked at these businesses before. I'm be making a you know a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and something like that if I'm doing pretty well. I have revenue. So, but what if the what if the other the same thing before? What if another person down the street has one of them and they're getting older or is it slowing down? You should always be talking to other people around you that to just ask them what are you going to do with this? What do you want to do with it long term? Um, and let them know that you're at that point because that you can just bring that into your company and it's not all that easy and everything and takes some, takes some work, but I can get doubling my business in that situation. I don't have to go out and find new customers. I don't have to go out and buy, you know, more equipment. I probably going to get an employee or two that know what they're doing in this whole thing. I can double over the course of 90 days. How can you do that any other way? I mean, so even as you get yeah. bigger, I mean, if you're a $5 million business and you got $1 million competitors out there, how hard is it for you to add another million dollars in revenue? You know, a small manufacturer is doing a few million dollars, but you see one down the street that's doing 500,000 and they got a good thing going. Why not talk to them? Mm-hmm. You just, you can, you can do that if they're in the right situation and you can work out the right deal. Um, again, it comes so- back to that win-win. I know we're winding down, but I do have a follow-up question to that. So I have worked with quite a number of clients who have gone through the acquisition process where they've been acquired by another organization. And I got to say, that's usually from, I would say, every experience I've had, a pretty intense and painful integration process. Mm. So is there some advice you would give there? Because I have yet to hear from anyone where they're just like, we just got acquired and it's been so massively amazing. Everything's going rosy. Like a yeah. year into it, like it's stressful. I, and they're, they're, culture. they're right. the culture trying to right. merge all of that, the processes, everyone's worried they're on the chopping block because you're merging right. everything. And so I guess I get the growth by acquisition, but I'm gonna be a little bit of a devil's advocate how do you address that painful merging of cultures? Because if you can't do that well, is that acquisition long-term going to be better if you have a team that's just morale is in the toilet? Great question. That is a great question. Because I think that if you're going to acquire companies, you got to work on your culture first. Yeah. I mean, you mm-hmm. do. Because if you got a bad culture, it's going to be a real stinker to, to integrate companies. You have to work on your systems and your people first. And, and really have, like Kurt was talking about, you have to be prepared like your stage in your house because you have to have a good house for people to come and live in. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to have trouble. The other thing that, that a lot of people see when you do that is if uh, an investor-owned company compared to a, you, one of us owning a company, they run very differently. And if those are the kind of acquisitions you see, they're, they are tougher just because it... Yeah. it there's no way, no how you can retain that same feeling in an investor owned company. It just, it's not possible because There's it's a no, different, it's yeah. so different. It's so different. But and when I talk so about fun. growth by acquisition, we're usually talking about, you know, in the same community, private owners, and that makes it a little less impactful. Right. Yeah. No matter what happens, there's going to be, there's change. No one likes change. But if you have your culture right before you go out and start acquiring companies, that will give you a lot a lot better chance of doing it without. And I would the- say if you're looking to acquire a company, that should be part of your vetting process is what is the culture of the company I'm oh, acquiring? Yeah. Like, 
Is it yes. going to be a really good fit for our culture? Or is it, you right. know, because there's not, there's not necessarily a good culture or a bad culture. There's, you know, there's just, there's differences there. Some, you know, and making sure that that's a fit, I would imagine would be really critical. But anyway, I know we're going over, but thank you, Damon. That was toxic great. leadership. Toxic leadership is not acceptable if yeah. you're going to acquire companies. Oh. It's not acceptable. Yeah. Right. Just Amen. It, it, Amen. You got to stop that. I'm just going to say it because you got to stop that cold, dead, get it the hell out before you even try. So, but what is, to, here's the thing. Okay. I've learned this term recently. It's a great one. It's, it's being unconsciously incompetent. Okay. <laughs> Unconsciously incompetent. So how many toxic leaders out there are aware that they're toxic? And how do you know if you're toxic as a leader, right? Yeah. Yeah. That you know like, what? How would you say the definition that's, of toxic is. That's gonna be, you know what? Guess what, Nicole? We just I I we have an opening, we have a date open. <laughs> and that's gonna be yeah. I thank you. Just filled our next yeah. that next one, and, yeah. And we have Gina Cox coming up in two weeks, and that's that. Uh, this is uh, so that my goodness, we could be here. Uh, yeah, for, let's sorry, hey, let's have a couple. Uh, yeah, Alexander, yeah. great, great, great comment. Yeah, everything starts with people. Alan in London, Alan, thank you for coming to us across the pond. And yeah. we've got flexibility strategies, processes, and management should be flexible. But Nicole, that's a great point of like, you know, toxic. And, and again, is it the leader? Is it the, the there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Right yeah. But I think overall, let, let's, 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 let's recap a few takeaways. Okay. First off, Damon, thank you, brother, dude. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your passion, your, this was just phenomenal. Brilliant. I've, wanted, Brilliant. I've wanted to do this for ages. And so it was just great to kind of flip the tables and have you and just, Really focus on your brilliance, your expertise. I love when you and I geek out about this topic. I, I just, I, I couldn't love it enough. Guys, entrepreneurs out there, boy, just be thinking about your business. At some point in time, man, Nicole said it, life is fragile. We don't know when that day is going to come. And just always, you know, not necessarily be thinking about how I'm going to sell my business, but how am I going to transition my business? What does it yeah. look like? Man, do it for the respect of your family. Do it for yeah. the respect yeah. of, your, of your your staff, your employees, or whatever that mm -hmm. might look like. And you know what? I can tell you firsthand, do it for yourself, man. It, there's and, you know, there's not a greater thing, man, than when you can sell your business. Somebody actually wants it. It is a great win. So all the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into your business and somebody can come along and that, and that can help entice or encourage you for that next step. Mm -hmm. And whether it's retirement or whatever it is, your next entrepreneurial uh, journey or whatever, uh, just you know, be thinking that way. Reach out to Damon if you have further questions. Uh, Alexander, another comment here. What's he say? That's if a great point. Happy, then you are there toxic, you man. Thank you, Alexander. Drop the mic and Brian says, great conversation. Brian, thank you. Connect with us. Nicole, thank you for being the co-hostess of with the Moses today. We appreciate you, Damon. I have one last burning question for you, my friend. It's the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> <laughs> I score guy on second base, and the manager looks down the bench and says, "Hey, Pastoka." Get up there and hit the winning run in. My friend, what is Damon Pastoka's walk-up song burning curious minds want to know? Ooh, I'll guess. tell you. Right here. <laughs> Little Ted Nugent stranglehold. Ted Nugent. I thought that All was the way. Little I hit that hard. Nugent. And and it's gonna shoot the place. And you're, you're too, and you're too young to know that one, right? <laughs> She's like, "Who's Ted Nugent?" Yeah, I really, I, I truly don't know who Ted Nugent. She is. doesn't know. He's crazy. So He's guys, crazy. you have to Google it. You go back into the the distant archives. Damon and I know exactly who Ted Nugent is, and uh, so Damon, that was a great one. I knew you knew that was coming at you. So, all right, guys, I want to thank you all Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for coming to us week in week out. Nicole, thank you. Damon, parting thoughts, words of wisdom that you want to share as we close out this week? Just, if you know, if you know anybody that's getting getting that thinking about exiting a business, just have them talk to somebody, research, think about what they really want to get out of it and how they do it and do it early because getting to the end, you don't have any options. If you start early, you got a lot of options. 
you know, let, let's yeah. let's end on this one. What does your what does and I don't know if you coined this or if your partner Andrew coined this. When somebody reaches a certain point in age or stage in life, what do you call it? <laughs> they're they're, they're going to die in their business. They're going to die at their desk. They you, yeah. every dude like that's so branded in my brain of like man, nobody please anybody if there's any takeaway today, just don't die at the desk. So all right. We're going to close out. We have a great guest on Monday. We've got Nancy yeah, O'Leary. Oh, our dear friend Nancy is going to be with us. We're going to be talking about manufacturing uh, Mavericks as we close out manufacturing month for October. So, guys, thank you for joining us. Just go out and be someone's inspiration, just like our dear friend Damon is. God bless you guys, and we will catch you next week. Thank you.